Hello, and welcome to this short video series about what's missing in AI and in neuroscience. I'm Paul Middlebrooks, the creator and host of the Brain Inspired podcast, and this course called NeuroAI, the quest to explain intelligence. Over the next three videos, I'm going to describe some of the open questions in AI and in neuroscience that highlight where we are in both fields and some of the challenges and opportunities to make progress to move forward beyond the current limitations. And I'll describe the emerging field of neuroAI and why many people think it holds promise to fill in missing gaps and help explain our own intelligence. First, who am I? Like I said, I create the Brain Inspired podcast about the interface of neuroscience and AI. But my research background is in neuroscience. I got my PhD studying decision making in monkeys, recording neural activity and relating that activity to their behavior. Specifically, I studied what's called metacognition, thinking about thinking and found neural correlates of metacognitive behavior in monkeys. After that, I did postdoctoral research studying what's called response inhibition, or countermanding, which is our ability to withhold our actions at the last moment. And I worked on a model to explain how the related neural activity might explain how our brains implement response inhibition. After my postdoc, I left academia, basically because I felt confined to my own specialized research area and I wanted a broader view and to think and learn more about bigger questions. For example, I learned about the exciting advances being made in AI, and I wanted to pursue how progress in AI was related to our brain function. So I decided to start the Brain Inspired podcast as a way for me to learn more and to share that knowledge with people like you. And through many conversations and my own readings and research, it became clear to me that all my experience and hard work could benefit others like me, and that led me to create the NeuroAI course. All right, let's get to the questions, uh, with one caveat. Compared to established sciences like physics, AI is a young field, and the recent developments in AI that have many people excited uh, are even younger. So many of the examples I'll use are active fields in AI, with lots of people making progress on solutions, but some are more fundamental open questions. I'll start with a goal of AI, which is roughly to build systems that satisfy our criteria for intelligence. And I know scientific advancement doesn't depend on definitions, but the promise of building human-level intelligence or artificial general intelligence uh, is odd when we don't really know what the end goal looks like. So it's worth asking how people define intelligence. Legg and Hutter collected a bunch of definitions and summarized it as the ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. More recently, Francois Cholet operationalized it as skill acquisition efficiency. So what do we have now? Most of the recent celebrated achievements come from deep learning and deep reinforcement learning. For example, a deep reinforcement learning network that learned to master the game of Go. But if we take these definitions seriously, we wouldn't call that network intelligent. It doesn't achieve goals in a wide range of environments. It achieves one goal in one environment. Nor does it acquire skills efficiently. It's trained on millions of examples. So what we have now, recognized by many people, is narrow AI, systems that can do one or a few things very well. As Meredith Browser puts it, general AI is what we want, what we hope for, and what we imagine. Narrow AI is what we have. It's the difference between dreams and reality. So the first open question is the focus of a ton of research, and that is how do we make AI general, or more general? One way to highlight this is to train a network on a variety of tasks and see what happens. So you can train a network to be an excellent dog detector, for instance. Then you can take that same network and teach it to be a world-class Go player. But then if you ask that network to again detect dogs, it's suddenly no good at it. This is called catastrophic forgetting. Training it on Go has made it forget how to detect dogs. And there are multiple lines of research trying to make networks that are good at multiple things and stay good at multiple things. These go by names like transfer learning or continual or lifelong learning. Adversarial examples are another popular way to illustrate how narrow and brittle deep learning is. Back to our dog detector here, you can add the right kind of noise to an image, and we still know that it's a dog, but now the network might report that it's an oven. And these kinds of failures have led to plenty of criticism of the current deep learning flavor of AI. For example, Udaya Pearl says, all the impressive achievements of deep learning amount to just curve fitting. But even if we solve those challenges, there are bigger challenges for what we would consider general intelligence to possess. Things that humans have that machines don't. Things like common sense. Intuitive physics, understanding how gravity works, for example. 
intuitive psychology. I can infer what other people are thinking, and I can usually predict what they'll do. A sense of the causal structure of the world. We understand abstract concepts and their meanings, and we can make analogies between concepts. And compositionality. We understand that things like bicycles are made of parts, and we can use those parts to build novel things that aren't bicycles. So that's question one. How do we make AI more general? And you can see there's a long way to go. The second open question I will pose is, how do we make AI more efficient? And this is really two questions because there are two ways that I mean efficient here. One sense of efficiency is power. So brains run on very little power, famously about as much as it takes to power a light bulb. Computers that run deep nets use much more power to achieve brain-like results. And because of the concern to reduce power, there are plenty of people working on developing neuromorphic chips that are in part inspired by the low power consumption of brains. The other sense of efficiency is learning efficiency. Deep networks require thousands or millions of training examples to perform well on their narrow tasks. Whereas if I show a child a picture of a fire truck, she can learn it in just one or just a few examples called one shot and few shot learning. This again is an active field in AI research, but it's unsolved. So that's the second question: how to make AI more efficient in both senses of the term. The third question I'll pose illustrates how AI has changed over time, and that is what is the right level of abstraction. So modern deep learning is sometimes called sub-symbolic because the data that you input into a network gets distributed among all the units in the network and transformed into an output. So if I input this image of a lion into a deep net, I would input it as a bunch of pixel values that get transformed into an answer, like it's a lion. This is in contrast to symbolic or good old-fashioned AI, which dominated early AI efforts. In those days, you would have to hand define some feature detectors, like a cat detector and a main detector, and the system would be given rules to manipulate those high-level symbols to produce an answer. But given that some people think deep learning is coming up against its limits for reasons I've already said, there's a recent push for what's called neurosymbolic AI, which aims to combine the fast, modular, rule-based approach of good old-fashioned AI with modern deep learning approaches to improve performance and generality. On the other hand, some neuro AI researchers think deep nets themselves are too simple. That modeling each unit as a point process and a clone of all the other units. Each with the same activation functions, maybe that misses out on a lot of the detail in real brains that may be important. For example, we know neurons come in different shapes and sizes; that some are excitatory and some inhibitory, and different neuron types have varying molecules that give rise to diverse physiological properties. We don't even know yet how many different types of neurons there are, but it's well over a hundred and counting. And it's been shown that even a single neuron can be modeled as a two-layer neural network. Because dendrites perform computations on incoming signals before those signals reach the body of the neuron. Another thing brains have that are virtually absent in artificial networks is anything that's not a neuron. For example, various types of glial cells, once thought to simply support metabolism and structure, are becoming more appreciated for their contributions to cognition. And there are all sorts of neuromodulators bathing the brain in response to different environmental stimuli and bodily states. One of the big successes in AI reinforcement learning mimics part of what's known about how dopamine functions in the brain, but there's a world of more opportunity with both glia and neuromodulators. So that's question three: What's the right mix of higher-level abstract symbol-based kinds of AI and finer-grain details we know that brains use? So the last two questions are, in some sense, more fundamental, and less people in AI are thinking and working on them. Question four is. How do we make AI for open-ended systems? So, what do I mean by this? As far as I know, all of the major successes in deep learning, including deep reinforcement learning, have been accomplished with closed systems in well-defined and well-specified problem spaces. Chess, for example, is a hard game, but the rules and pieces are completely specified. It's a closed system. The world is an open system, always changing, and we have to adapt to those changes. Douglas Hofstadter, writing in 1979. About what true AI might look like, imagines asking an AI, "Do you want to play chess?" And the AI might say, "No, I'm bored with chess. Let's talk about poetry." And actually, I recently taught my kids how to play chess, and they actually enjoyed it for a while. But soon, my son decided he was bored with it, 
he took the chess pieces and pretended they were at war, of course ignoring the board and the way that the pieces move. And that's one example of open-endedness. In fact, Laura Schultz, who studies child development, has a theory that uh, kids making up games is an evolutionary adaptation to create problems for themselves that may come in handy later in life in an open-ended world. Stuart Kaufman uses the example of a screwdriver. He makes the point that you fundamentally can't predict all the uses of a screwdriver. For example, you might use a screwdriver as a spear if you're hungry and near a river. Or you might use it to open paint cans. You could use it as a doorstop, or even as a mallet for a xylophone. And you can imagine an infinity of possibilities of how to use a screwdriver. And of course, this brings up the human skills of creativity and insight and abductive inference, arguably none of which AI systems currently have. So how do we move AI beyond closed systems to something more like what we experience in the world, an open-ended system? All right, this last question is another more fundamental one, and I think it depends on how you define intelligence. But there's a big obvious difference between machines and ourselves, and that's autonomy. Is autonomy necessary for intelligence? Is life? So we aren't just brains. We're embodied in a deep way. And we're embedded in that open-ended world. And our intelligence has been carved by evolution, arguably with the ultimate function to survive and reproduce. And this is the kind of fact that has led to schools of thought like embodied cognition. And for now, we tell machines what to do. We provide their objective functions. We define what a reward is to them. They have no intrinsic motivation. We turn on and off their power. And this is very different from us having to maintain ourselves far from thermal equilibrium. And there may be something unique about having to evolve and survive under so many different constraints and pressures. In any case, there may be a lot to learn about intelligence from how we survive based on our intrinsic motivations. But again, this is an open question. Is autonomy or life necessary for intelligence? Okay, for fun, I'm going to add one bonus question here, and that is, is consciousness necessary for intelligence? So when I, or when a sci-fi writer generally thinks of artificial intelligence, it's conscious. It feels like something to be the robot or the AI. Of course, consciousness itself remains an open mystery. We don't know how brains underlie our subjective experience. We don't know why we're conscious, what its function is, and we sure don't know how to build it. But there are people in the AI world starting to appreciate that maybe what we need moving forward is to build in some functions that we commonly associate with consciousness. Bingio, a deep learning pioneer, recently wrote, We propose here a new kind of prior for top-level abstract representations of concepts of the kind humans manipulate with natural language, inspired by modern theories of consciousness. So just something extra for you to think about. Okay, those are my five open questions related to what's missing in AI. In the next video, I'll do the same, but for neuroscience. See you then.